I'm introducing Dr. Lawrence Amsel today, who's on the Zoom right now, as you can see. So Dr. Amsel studied mathematics before completing his MD at Yale University School of Medicine and MPH and biostatistics at Columbia University. After 9-11, he trained thousands of community clinicians in evidence-based treatments for PTSD and complicated grief. His research applies decision science tasks in psychiatric research and explores the role of biological mechanisms in decision science of suicide prevention. Dr. Amsel has devoted his, his uh, career to studying the lifelong effects of trauma in children's mental health as Associate Director of the Global Psychiatric Epidemiology Group at Columbia University, an edited and invited book, An International Perspective on Disasters in Children's Mental Health. So I have also had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Amsel as part of the GPEG group. Um, we've worked on many studies having to do with children and adolescents, looking at topics such as 9-11, um, experiences with living um, with a parent who's been arrested or incarcerated. So we've worked on several different studies looking at different traumatic events that children may undergo in their lives. We've also um, done a pilot study looking at, um, looking at decision making and how that impacts people as well. Um, so I've had a really great time um, working with him and I've actually also been able to observe him do his clinical training in the psychiatric um, in, uh, inpatient unit of the hospital. So I've had that experience as well. So I've seen him in action working with patients and he does a really wonderful job and really connects with people. Um, and I think that he'll be a really great resource for you guys in terms of learning clinical techniques and understanding how to work with patients. Thank you, <clears throat> Megan, for that um, very kind, in kind introduction. So this morning, what we're going to be talking about is, is um, for the primary care clinician, how to recognize psychosis and bipolar disorder. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I would like to mention, as, uh, as Megan said, uh, uh, I work at the uh, Columbia University with the GBEG team and with this new <clears throat> Guyana collaboration. Um, I also work with something called the REACH Training uh, Organization, and they reach out to primary care clinicians to train them how to handle mental health cases in primary care, because we know that there are not enough mental health experts to handle all the mental health cases. And very important for us to train primary care clinicians to be able to handle those cases in their own practice. We've trained over 5,000 people. Um, our focus was on pediatrics, but we also now do adult primary care people. The program consists of an intense three-day workshop and then virtual rounds, small group discussions of actual cases from the, from the students' cases. Um, the doctors who come to train with us bring their cases to us and we discuss them just like you would do in, in, uh, in rounds, <clears throat> walking from bed to bed. Um, so they are these wonderful discussions and they go on for six months. So it's a very special training program. People get CME for the whole thing. And during this Guyana conference, um, <clears throat> through a collaboration between GPEG and REACH, we've been able to bring you three out of the 15 modules in the whole training, depression, anxiety, which I've already done. And today we're gonna do one combined module on psychosis and bipolar disorder. And in the future, we hope to bring the whole ver version, the entire training, the full training to Guyana so that the primary care clinicians in Guyana can take advantage of uh, this organized training and be more comfortable with mental health care cases. Let's start with psychosis. Um, our goals are to differentiate between different kinds of psychosis um, and between the different kinds of symptoms that take place in psychosis and then talk about some treatment options. What is psychosis? A lot of people <clears throat> are a little bit uh, confused about what psychosis is um, and we can make that clear now. It's severely disruptive thought and behavior resulting in loss of developmentally appropriate reality testing with the emphasis on reality testing. There are overt changes in functioning and there's evidence of disrupted thinking on the mental status exam. You don't even have to do the mental status exam. With psychosis, you generally see the disruption just by interviewing the patient. 
psychotic symptoms are very characteristic of schizophrenia. But many people think of schizophrenia and psychosis as the same thing, and they're not, because psychoses are particular symptoms. They do occur in schizophrenia, but they also occur in lots of other conditions. They occur during mood disorders, neurological conditions can do them, acute intoxication with substances can cause psychosis. So psychosis are a basket, a group of different symptoms uh, that can occur under many conditions. Psychiatric disorders other than schizophrenia that are involved with psychosis are schizoaffective disorder, psychotic mood disorders, very oftentimes PTSD involving in abused youth can cause psychotic symptoms as well. There are medical causes of psychosis, CNS infections, delirium, neoplasia, endocrine disorders. There are some genetic disorders, autoimmune disorders and toxins that can all cause psychotic symptoms. The substances, the common substances that cause psychotic symptoms are listed here. Um, uh, uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms are an example, steroids are an example. And when you do have psychosis due to intoxication, it usually remits when the uh, intoxication settles down. So uh, within two, one to two days, um, there is usually a, a remission and the psychotic symptoms will go away, but that's not always the case. Sometimes people have long-term, um, they sometimes have a long-term effect uh, in, rare, in rare cases. And sometimes schizophrenia first presents after substance ingestion. So just because somebody has had a substance ingestion before they present with psychosis doesn't mean that they're not schizophrenic. It's possible that both of those things can occur. Okay, let's think about what the cognitive domains of psychosis are. Well, the answer is they disrupt the healthy life order. And in healthy life, in order to function, you need the following things. I need to perceive external reality in an accurate fashion. I need to reason in a logical fashion about these perceptions. I need to form beliefs based on those perceptions, perceptions which is different than just thinking or reasoning about them. It's forming a belief system. And then I need to behave in accordance with these beliefs. So this is how I generally interact with what we so-called reality. <clears throat> Here's the architecture of psychotic symptoms. Instead of perceiving correctly, I can have hallucinations. Hallucinations are <clears throat> um, when I have a perception, I have, um, for example, an auditory hallucination is I hear a voice in a visual hallucination, I see something that's not there. So it's possible to have a hallucination in all five senses, but it's most common in auditory hallucinations. What about reasoning? <clears throat> I have something in psychosis called formal thought disorder, which means I can't think straight. I can't think logically. I think in a disorganized fashion. How are beliefs affected? This is very uh, well understood as paranoia. So I can have delusions. Paranoia is one kind of a delusion. It's a delusion that I'm being attacked or that something is, is coming to harm me. That's a paranoid delusion. But I have many other kinds of delusions. I can have delusions, uh, for example, I believe that um, I am Abraham Lincoln. Um, that's not a paranoid delusion, but it is a delusion. It's a false fixed belief. Finally, behavior. So I showed you the, or the architecture in terms of the normal functioning and how it's disrupted. And same thing with behavior. I can have disorganized behavior, which is non-goal oriented behavior, sometimes aggressive. Catatonia is an example of that, in which I can have psychotic symptoms in catatonia, in which I have strange behaviors. So let's, this slide's coming up in pieces. So delusions. I can have several types of delusions. I can have ideas of reference, which means that I think the television is sending me signals. I can have beliefs that I'm being persecuted or have special powers, and I've talked about that. In thought disorders, there is breaks in the train of thought and hallucinations we've explained. Behaviors are odd or disorganized. So this is in adults and in children. These are the categories of the type of psychotic symptoms that I can have. The common feature is it's a break with the normal way in which I interact with reality in order to have constructive behaviors. 
the epidemiology of psychosis, children under 12 years old, schizophrenia is very rare. So if somebody presents with, uh, with uh, delusions or with psychotic symptoms, um, it, it, it is very rare that the, uh, the cause of it will be uh, schizophrenia. Um, in 13 to 17 year olds, uh, it's a little bit more present. And in adults, it's about 1% of the population in most cultures in which it's been checked, uh, it's been evaluated. Now, it's careful to make sure that you um, evaluate whether or not a symptom is actually a psychotic symptom. There are many symptoms or situations that appear where they may be mistaken for psychotic symptoms, but they're not. For example, an illusion where I hear sounds or visualizations, usually in the evening and at night, and I think I see a shape. That's not a, a, that's not a hallucination. It's an illusion. It's when I see shapes and I might misinterpret them uh, at, at night, or I imagine that uh, I hear someone calling my name, which is a common thing when people are far away from home. They don't actually have a hallucination. They just imagine that. Those are those kinds of those kinds of vague voices that come in. Imaginary friends are normal developmental things. Those are not delusions. Um, and then fantasy and young people. Well, young people have a lot of fantasies, but they don't necessarily believe them as if they were delusions. They understand that those are different than their reality. So these should not be confused with psychotic symptoms. How do you talk to children about psychotic symptoms? Here's some examples of words that you can use to introduce a conversation. And notice one of the things that they do here is to normalize this. And the, the, when I say normalize it, I mean you say something like, Lots of times kids tell me that they hear or see weird, funny, or even scary things that they're not sure are real. Does that happen to you? So when I say lots of times kids tell me this, right, then I'm normalizing it. I'm making it okay for the kid to share that with me, okay? Questions like, does your mind ever play tricks on you? So it's a way of asking the question that doesn't put the, person, the young child on the defensive. Do you hear voices talking to you when nobody is there? Does your mind ever feel confused? So these are or ways of opening a conversation. How do we evaluate psychosis? There are core symptoms and symptoms are very important, obviously in all of medicine, but there's also impairment and functioning that I want to set up because I can have symptoms um, and the symptoms can sometimes interfere with functioning. Sometimes symptoms don't interfere with functioning. So it's important to assess functioning and symptoms separately. I also want to be very careful to, um, to monitor drug toxicity. As I told you, it's a major cause of these things. You want to rule out any central nervous system lesions or other medical conditions. Now, what happens if you come across a child or an adolescent who has, psych has, has psychosis? Um, acutely for the first time, usually referral to emergency room or to a mental health professional for the first time psychosis is important. Um, it, we don't recommend, we don't recommend that for a first break of psychosis that it's, that, that is handled in, in, in the primary care setting. It's important for you to identify it, but that's one of the cases where you want to work with the mental health professional to set up a, a treatment plan, and then you can monitor that treatment plan going forward. Um, and for kids, the kinds of medications that are going to be used are listed here. Abilify, Risperdal, Cyprexa, and Seroquel. These have FDA in America. These have FDA approval for schizophrenia. Um, for emergency psychosis, in cases where no emergency room is available um, or you are stuck in it, you, you, you feel that a child is psychotic, these are emergency medications in cases that uh, again, only in really emergency cases do you want to be starting and using these medications. But if a child is in, in, a, in a psychotic peril, they're, they're really disorganized and they need uh, a medication immediately before you can get them, even before you can get them to the emergency room or in, in the cases where there's no other thing available, these are the medications. Olanzapine, Risperdal, and uh, uh, Ziprazidone are available um, for those kinds of immediate emergency uses. Now, when we're talking about the atypical antipsychotics, the kinds of medications that are, are going to be used here, and again, when it comes to depression and anxiety, we strongly recommend that those are treated as much as possible in the primary care setting. When it comes to psychosis, as I said, we believe that the initial plan should be made in a mental health 
uh, in conjunction with a mental health person. But what's going to happen is though you'll usually have that initial thing and then you may take over the case and monitor that child or adolescent over time. So you should be aware that these are the safety and tolerability of atypicals. The side effect profiles are different across the different ones. They have the, the they, as you can see, for example, risperidone um, may have a high a risk factor for elevated prolactin, where some of the others won't. Um, there is only, is a prazidone in particular, has some side effect of the QTC prolongation, which can be problematic. Um, and so you would choose these medications based on the side effects in mo many, many cases, because in terms of their efficacy, they're usually pretty equivalent. Some people respond to one or another uh, medication, and sometimes you have to make a trial, but their efficacy is not usually the primary choice. The primary choice is made based on the side effect profile and how that interacts with the child. Also, if you have a child on one of these atypical and antipsychotics, here is a list, and we can make this we can make this list available to you. And it's also available at um, at the JCAP Journal here. This is an article in two thousand and eight, which still remains up to date. Um, and what it recommends is the kinds of assessments that you want to do and the frequency of those of the of those assessments. Now, many of these assessments would be part of an, an annual physical in any case. So they're not all, they're not as burdensome as it appears from first uh, looking at looking at these lists. But these are the lists of the kinds of things that you want to evaluate on a regular basis if you have kids on uh, an atypical antipsychotic. What about an EKG? As I mentioned before, it's always a prazidone that has that real risk factor for QTC prolongation. So is a prazidone is the only one that has a strong recommendation for using an EKG as a base at a baseline. What about the chronic, the long-term use of these things? We've mentioned how, to, how, to, how this is initiates, but what about the long-term? Um, the chronic psychotic patient can, can be treated in primary care and in your practice. You can manage a schizophrenic adolescent if, again, you've had mental health help in, to, to, to begin with, um, or at least some kinds of consultation with mental health to begin with. So um, these, these, these conditions, when they've stabilized, and they are chronic, um, you can manage them in the primary care setting, again, by using those monitors for side effects and by also closely observing for the persistence or the treatment of uh, the actual psychosis itself, making sure that that uh, is under control. So that's a quick summary of, uh, again, of psychosis. And again, our philosophy is we want primary care clinicians to be aware of psychosis, but in children and adolescents, um, that is going to be done in partnership. Similarly, um, bipolar disorder is something that uh, we want all primary care clinicians to be aware of. And in some cases, when there is no uh, mental health resources available, the primary clinician will actually be treating the bipolar disorder, um, ideally in conjunction at least with some mental health in input, but um, it, that's also doable if those other resources aren't available. So let's discuss how we recognize and treat bipolar disorder. What are our learning objectives for this half? We want to differentiate classical bipolar disorder from other conditions that often get it confused with bipolar disorder, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, disruptive mood, all of these things are often confused. We want to monitor the side effects when we're managing or co-managing bipolar disorder um, with a mental health professional, and we better understand current treatments. Those were our, our learning objectives uh, for understanding bipolar disorder in primary care. Now, there was some interesting research that has been done over the last many years in which what was shown was that the diagnosis of bipolar disorder shot up tremendously. So there was a tremendous uptick in people getting the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And many people said, oh mate, this is a great thing because we're, all, we're recognizing all this bipolar disorder that we didn't see before. But the research indicates that that's not true, that the diagnosis simply became a diagnosis that people gave very easily without doing careful evaluations. And 
in some places that the, the rate of increase of the diagnosis was 1700% um, over a period of time. So that I teach my residents that if they see in a chart that a child or adolescent was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, they should ignore that, ignore that diagnosis because it's been used very carelessly and make your own assessment. Let's define bipolar disorder. A manic episode is required for the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. If a kid comes in and you see he has changing moods and he says, oh, my moods change a lot. Um, I'm sad in the morning, I'm, I'm happy at night. That is not a manic episode, okay? Small changes in moods are not a manic episode. It has to be uh, a real full-blown manic episode in order to get the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. It's uncommon prior to puberty. Typically 15 to 30 is the first time you see it. The lifetime rate of bipolar disorder in teens is one half of a percent. And the, the bipolar spectrum disorders, in other words, the bipolar one and two and other, other forms of it are maximal at 2%. So this is not a, as common as the diagnosis seems if you look at charts where a lot of people get the diagnosis unnecessarily. So how do you strictly define this? You need a distinct period, an episode lasting at least a week of irritable elevated mood with increased energy and behavior different from normal. Very often you'll see a child who has mood swings, but he's had those mood swings his whole life. That's again, not a bipolar disorder. A bipolar disorder is a distinct episode in which uh, the child or adolescent is behaving in one fashion and then is significantly changed um, for, uh, during the episode of mania. Here are the, 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 in addition to elevated mood, here are the important symptoms. Hyperactivity, irritability, Psychosis is present sometimes, but not always in bipolar disorder. Remember, we talked about psychosis as a symptom, not a diagnosis. It's um, sometimes present in mania. When you see psychosis and mania, it's often in the form of grandiosity. An adolescent will, will show up and they will be agitated, have high energy, and they will tell you that they are the smartest student in their whole school. They will tell you they're smarter than all their teachers. They have very, very grandiose delusions. And that's part of the, the, the psychosis. They have an elevated, expanded mood. They have very rapid thought and rapid speech as if they lived in New York. It's actually much faster than that. You can notice that the speech is very fast. And if you ask them what's going on in your head, they'll say, my thoughts are moving so fast, I can't even keep up with my words. They sometimes have sleep problems. It's not insomnia because insomnia, you're tired and exhausted, but you still can't sleep. When you have sleep problems in mania, you're not sleeping, but even though you're not sleeping, you're not tired. They continue to have perfectly normal and elevated energy without the need for sleep. The other things to consider are that drugs can produce manic-like symptoms. Um, there is a worry, which turns out to be, it's not very common, but sometimes there's a worry that antidepressants could induce mania. Um, but it's less common, it's, it is less common than we had originally thought that this can happen. Um, so uh, be aware of that if you have a child and he's being treated for depression, that sometimes you can see the emergence of mania. But notice this, I may very well have an individual who has bipolar disorder and the first manifestation of that bipolar disorder is a depression and later on they have a manic episode and that could happen on or off the antidepressant so it may be that they would have had that manic episode anyway so it's a little bit confusing sometimes when the first presentation of a bipolar uh, disease is the depression because then I, if the person has bipolar disorder I can expect that there will be another episode which is mania with or without an antidepressant. Um, on the other hand, there may be kids who are not bipolar, um, and this is again, a, in rare, rare cases, they're not intrinsically bipolar, but the antidepressant could induce a manic episode. So let's talk about uh, a case. Nicola is 10 years old. She had a brief depression, which resolved with just psychotherapy. 
She's now 14 years old. And for several weeks, her parents say her personality changed. They think maybe she's just hanging out with the wrong crowd. She's suddenly wearing very provocative clothing. She just walks up to strangers and she talks to them. She's up all night and she's speaking in a vulgar fashion, which was not her style. Her mood goes from laughing to irritability. And again, as we said, not really sleeping much. Why is Nicole classic? Because it's a distinct episode of changed behavior. She meets the DSM criteria, as we mentioned before, with the elevated mood, the sleep, the grandiosity, all of those things were present. She has the history of depressive disorder. So that tells us, oh, this is not a, a case of primarily uh, a depressive disorder, but this is a bipolar disorder. And when we dig deeper, it turns out there's a family history of mood disorder. So one thing to be aware of is that uh, while Nicole is a classical case, when you just see somebody who is irritable, um, be aware of the fact that Irritability can happen in multiple different disorders, as we see a, a list over here. So irritability alone, uh, again, is it should not be uh, labeled bipolar disorder, um, but you should worry about all the other kinds of psychiatric disorders that can bring on an irritability and a sudden kind of quick anger, and um, that can be confused for bipolar disorder. For example, ADHD can present with emotional dysregulation. Um, kids with ADHD can be very hyperactive, as, as we know, but they also can have all kinds of secondary things because they're often chided by their teachers, they're scolded, so they can be irritable, they can show up with irritability. Um, and um, it's very important to be able to distinguish ADHD from bipolar disorder because the medication regime and the treatment regime will obviously be extremely different. So like the case of Nicola, let's say that you have a situation in which there is a child or an ad, more likely, as we said, an adolescent, um, and you feel that you've carefully made the diagnosis. You have noticed that they have a distinct change. It uh, presents with all of the proper symptoms. Um, and you've done a careful evaluation of that. How is mania managed? As we said, we don't expect in general uh, primary care clinicians to be the, the primary person to diagnose or initiate treatment. But you, again, you may be in conditions where you're all that, uh, all that they're there. You may, be the only, you may be the only clinical expertise available and you may be involved in it. Um, and so uh, co-management is the ideal, but it's not always available. In the immediate case where someone presents acutely, you want to be sure that you inquire about any concerns and any safety. Because in a manic episode, interestingly, there is a greater risk for suicidality than there is in a depressive episode, which is counterintuitive because you would think that a manic episode, kids are in a good elevated mood. Why would they ever want to hurt themselves in that mood? But the moods in bipolar disorder are quite rapidly changing and behaviors are very impulsive. Taken together, that means that there's a higher risk for suicidality. Um, you want to make sure that there's no neglect or abuse or trauma that's taken place. If the presentation uh, involves the presence of antidepressants, the person had been on an antidepressant for a prior depressive episode, stop the antidepressant, taper it, taper it off as part of the initial treatment. Be aware that in severe manic episodes, the behavior can be so intense um, that hospitalization is necessary. Um, just to give an example, um, I treated this 16-year-old uh, um, who got into a manic episode. He went into um, his parents' uh, uh, clothing and their uh, pocketbooks and things. And he took the credit cards and he went down and he bought himself a, a, a very, very expensive suit. And this 16 year old, he looked like an adult. He was one of those 16 year olds who really looked like an adult. And he passed himself off as an adult. He passed himself off as the holder of these credit cards. And he flew to Miami 
and he um, he set himself up on the beach in Miami and told everybody he created some flyers and he told everybody that he was a movie producer and people were actually lining up and um, he was doing this for days until the police came around and uh, investigated and found that it was just having a manic episode. He believed he was a producer and he had spent huge amounts of, uh, 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 of money uh, in this Florida in this Florida hotel um, and he was actually having a manic episode. So that would be the kind of behavior that was very worrisome and could require hospitalization um, in order for the person's behavior to be contained while the, the um, manic episode is treated. Um, so here are the pediatric labeling uh, for mania. Lithium and so essentially, if you look at these things, there's two kinds of medications here. Lithium is a very good medication uh, for bipolar disorder and has an indication. And these of the are atypical antipsychotics that you're aware of from uh, from from other uh, um, other disorders that you treat with them. Schizophrenia, as we said, aggression. They're used to treat. And in the case of bipolar disorder, they actually have an FDA approval for kids from 10 years old um, and on. Here is a resource. Um, this is an article down here. You can see the reference. Again, we'll get you that reference if you want from CoWatch. He's developed a kind of a, uh, a, a decision tree for how to treat um, bipolar disorder. And it looks confusing, but it's actually very, very straightforward. What it says is you, when you start the thing, when you start the treatment, you're going to start with an atypical antipsychotic, or you could start with lithium. Now we have valproate listed, and that is, we'll talk about that in a minute. That's also an, an, an option, but again, it doesn't have an FDA indication, only lithium and the atypicals does. So you try to, so you start with that medication and evaluate for the remission of symptoms. I'm So uh, the symptom reduction. And if you get a positive response, stay on that medication. But if you get a negative response, then go back and switch. If you are on an atypical, switch to lithium. If you are on lithium, switch to the atypical. So it's a very, very simple paradigm for what to, for what to do. If you still don't get uh, a good response, then it's okay to use two mood stabilizers. For example, you could use lithium um, and risperidone together. So you could use two medications on that. And if you don't get a response on that, there are cases, and these are rare, where you have to go and have three medications and use, let's say, um, two different uh, mood stabilizers. In the adult world, that, that's more typical that you've got to have all of those medications in order to break the manic episode. Once you've broken the manic episode, you can back off and only use one of the medications for the maintenance phase. But sometimes in order to break the manic episode, you have to go through these trials. Um, am I gonna go with an atypical or with lithium? Um, and then see whether or not you need to combine them if a single episode, if a single agent doesn't work. We've discussed the atypicals already. And you do need to monitor the levels uh, uh, for lithium if you're using lithium. Um, blood levels are very important because different, you can't say what the dose should be. Uh, different people metabolize lithium in different ways. Um, so uh, it's important that you, you draw blood levels um, to make sure that you know whether or not they have an adequate blood level for treatment. If they don't have an adequate blood level, um, you're not going to get efficacy with that medication. What you do is you draw 12 hours after the last dose. So um, if someone's taking their lithium in the morning, you make sure that their blood draw takes place before the next morning's um, uh, dose of medication. Uh, you also wanna wait for steady state. So if you really wanna understand uh, what the blood level is and you've made a change in dosage, wait five days after the change in dosage, then after the five days, have the person take their morning dose 12 hours later. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's 12 hours later. So it's, it, it's for the evening dose, you'll draw the, the medication in the morning. Um, for the, usually you'll, you'll say if 
you want to draw the blood level. You want them to take the medication 12 hours prior to the scheduled blood, blood draw. I had said 24. Hmm. Let me correct myself. An estimate, again, is, is it could be 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, but it's variable on each, um, each kid, and that's why you need the blood dose. What are the side effects? There's weight gain. There can be an acne problems. Hypothyroidism take, can take place. So you want the baseline laboratories of the CBC, a differential. You want to make sure that the individual is not pregnant. Um, if it's a sexually active teen, um, you do want to get an EKG and a renal and thyroid function tests um, at the baseline. And every six months, you want to check the level at thyroid functioning, BUN, and serum creatinine. You want to recheck, um, as we said, the thyroid function at 1, 6, and 12 months. And then you can, um, if it's a going, person's going to be on the medication more stably, uh, then uh, you want to repeat the TSH every three months because there is that problem of possible thyroid uh, side effects. So those are the things to uh, generally, again, to know uh, a, an overview of what you want to worry about with lithium and how you want to manage it. And when I first started in psychiatry, lithium was really the mainstay uh, uh, back then. And then it was surpassed by a lot of the atypicals were used in bipolar, but now lithium is coming back as uh, many of you might notice as, as really as a, as a medication, because it turns out that um, it is very efficacious and the side effect profile, while it can be complicated, um, uh, can be more advantageous some of the atypicals because of weight gain and problems with them. So lithium is definitely a medication that's coming back in, in, in use in the treatment of bipolar disorder, and you should be aware of it. Now, we'll talk for a few minutes about valproic acid or um, uh, valproate. Again, for children, this does not have an indication as of yet, but there are people who use it because there are indications in adults. Um, and so there are people who are using valproate for bipolar disorder, and it is an effective medication for it. Um, the, essentially, the guidelines for, for for um, valproate are very similar to its guidelines as an anticonvulsant. And that was, of course, the primary use of valproate was as an anti-seizure medication. We do have to take blood levels um, and you get a steady state faster than lithium in two to three, three days. So you wanna do the same thing where you do a blood draw 30 minutes before your next dose. Um, the side effects to be aware of, nausea, vomiting, tremors, sedation sometimes, Oftentimes, these kinds of side, the side effects that are listed up, these three side effects te are, tend to be transitory. It's very important to tell the patient, you may have some side effects that'll only last for a couple of days while your body gets used to the medication. Um, and it's important to give people that heads up because otherwise people, they get the side effect and they're scared they're gonna have it forever. Longer, thing, pr longer term problems are weight gain, um, and, and hair, hair loss and decreased platelets. These can occur, and those are reasons to stop the medication. Also, liver toxicity, pancreatitis, um, hyperinsulinemia, and polycystic ovary disease we'll talk about in a second. So there are these more serious but more rare side effects. We want you to be aware of those. And the FDA has put out warnings for the hepatotoxicity and the pancreatitis. Again, be aware of them if you have a patient on valproate. For a, uh, for a steady amount of time, um, but they are more rare than, than uh, the, 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 the common side effects, which are um, you know, less threatening. Polycystic ovary uh, uh, syndrome um, is a problem, and uh, it's, it's something that we really need to be aware of. The mechanism is, of these is unclear, as is the, uh, the loss of, of menses, which can occur in conjunction with this. Uh, so that is uh, something to be aware of and to, and to monitor um, because that could be quite, that can be a serious side effect. But again, it is not, uh, it's not a typical side effect that it doesn't occur that often. With, the, uh, with Valproate, the target dose of, of 20 milligrams is, is, is typical. Start patient at 15 milligrams and then check a serum level. You can start seeing uh, onset of action at seven to, four, seven to 14 days. Now, I've said this in other talks. It's very important to recognize that most psychiatric medications do not work like uh, 
um, you know, antibiotics. They don't, you don't see results in a day or two. It takes a while to see the results. And this is one of the things that really gets in the way of good treatment because the patients see the side effects, but they don't see the positive effects. So in the first week, they're just saying, all this is doing is making me worse. Doctor, this medication is no good for me. It makes me worse. It's not making me better. The good stuff comes later. The good stuff comes later. And something that I, I often will say to a patient is the good stuff comes later. Your body will adjust to the side effects and the positive effects will take place later. Uh, it will definitely, uh, um, it will definitely, well, not definitely. I, I catch myself when I say it will definitely. Um, but it has a very good chance, a very high likelihood um, that a properly, you know, properly used divalproate will get people out of a manic crisis. So in summary, bipolar disorder is often difficult to diagnose. And unless we see a full-blown manic episode, um, don't diagnose mood swings as bipolar disorder. The course can be very variable. And even people who have bipolar disorder can have a manic episode and then not have another manic episode for many years. <clears throat> Others can have up to two to three episodes in the course of the year. By the way, there's a phrase rapid cycling bipolar disorder. And I have a lot of uh, situations in which someone would come in with me, an adolescent would come in, they've been reading on the internet and they say, I have rapidly cycling bipolar disorder. I'm happy in the morning, sad in the afternoon, then happy again in the evening. And I say, no, no, that's not rapid. That's rapidly cycling moods, but that's not rapidly cycling bipolar disorder means three manic episodes in a year. So um, again, um, be careful with mixing up the idea of changing moods um, or not bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a distinct episode of mania, which is really quite dramatic um, in presentation. So, uh, that actually ends it, and we can have uh, time for questions. Um, hi, thank you very much, Larry, Dr. Amsel, about this. I posted one question. Um, many, many people who have bipolar um, also have co-occurring substance use, and how does that relate to the medication? Lithium, Zyproxa, I mean, they're, they're pretty potent. I mean, probably Zyproxa most. Well, I, I, I would say, I would say that, it, that to start with, yes, it's possible to have bipolar disorder co-occurring with, um, with substance abuse. But I would say that we be very, very careful when you see those cases, because very often there's no bipolar disorder at all. It's just substance abuse. And because of the substance abuse, the person is having variable moods and the person is going into CNS toxicity and they're having variable moods. Uh, so I would say that when you have a case like, a case like that, the first most important thing is to make sure that the, the individual is properly tapered off substances that they're involved with and um, you know they're detoxed appropriately with proper medical detoxification only after they have been detoxed and they have been carefully detoxed can I evaluate whether or not they have bipolar disorder while someone's intoxicated it's impossible to differentiate symptoms of the intoxication from bipolar disorder so um, no, that would I, be very I, so that's the, that that's the approach the approach is to detoxify the person first before you assume they have bipolar disorder. I have seen too often um, that people start a medication while a person is still using um, uh, illicit substances and, they, uh, and the doctors will add um, uh, a treatment for so-called bipolar disorder on top of the other medications that they're taking. Uh, that's, not, you know, that's, not, that's not the right approach. So detoxification off their medications and if they still are bipolar, then you treat them like anybody else. So, yeah, I mean, what if you have prior history of, and someone comes into the ER with prior history of bipolar, and they come in, I mean, that's what happens. They taper them off their alcohol to subdue the mania. 
But again, in that situation, I would say the first aspect of the approach is um, the first aspect of that approach is to make sure that they are tapered, uh, not tapered, they are detoxified. Depending on what substance they're using, there are different medical procedures for detoxifying somebody from alcohol or from heroin or from any of these things. So detoxify the person first before you add um, you, you add medi medications. Even if someone has a history of bipolar disorder, um, if they're using drugs right now, the symptom presentation can be very confusing. So you've got to get them off those drugs um, and uh, first and then clarify the diagnosis. At that point, um, you can start a treatment for bipolar disorder. Thank you. So Larry, I also have a question. So you touched briefly on bipolar disorder and talked about episodes of suicidality during manic episodes. So is there an association um, between ADHD and between um, psychosis and suicidal ideation as well? Well, uh, well, you're throwing in a lot of different, a, a, a lot of different things. Uh, let me say that this first of all, ADHD is far more common than bipolar disorder, and even in somebody who has a family history of bipolar disorder, they have an elevated risk for having bipolar disorder. But still, epidemiologically and risk-wise, if somebody comes in and they're agitated, they don't have a full-blown manic, manic episode, but they're restless, they're agitated, it's much more likely to be ADHD because again, ADHD is far more common. Even in families which have a, a bipolar, uh, a bipolar diathesis, a bipolar risk, it's much more likely to have ADHD as the primary diagnosis. Bipolar disorder, again, in adolescents, relatively um, is relatively is relatively rare. Mm -hmm. And could you speak a little bit about the risk for suicidality with people with psychosis? Is that a risk? Generally. Yeah, so as I said, bi bipolar, dis bipolar disorder with or without psychosis um, mm -hmm. gives you an elevated risk for suicidality. Um, why? Because you're doing lots of impulsive and risky things anyway. So if for some reason it, uh, during the course of the manic episode, you have this idea, um, oh, I think I, I, I you know, think life's not, not worth living. And at times, even when you're in, in a manic episode, again, moods shift. And um, you can become irritable. One morning you're, you're very happy, but the next morning you're quite irritable, if not sad. And you can say, oh, this is an uncomfortable situation. But manic patients tend to act on their thoughts very impulsively. So that's why the risk, that's why the risk is elevated. Does that make sense? It's because they act, it's not because they're very sad, like the risk in depression, it's because they're very impulsive. So if the thought comes into their head, they may act on that thought, just like they act on lots of other thoughts. Um, so that's the risk factor for, for or bipolar disorder. In psychosis, there's also a risk because again, you're out of touch with reality. And when you're out of touch with reality, you may think that people are coming to attack you. Um, so you wanna defend yourself, or you may think suddenly that everyone's against you and, um, and therefore you feel very alone um, and you, feel very, you can feel very abandoned. So in psychosis, there's lots of different uh, confusions that take place. And some of those confusions can lead people uh, to suicidality. It's also interesting in psychosis in, in, in people that's one of the unusual facts is um, that um, people who have great insight into the fact that they have schizophrenia. So let's say somebody 17, 18 years old, they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, but they're highly intelligent, insightful people. And they understand that their life with schizophrenia <clears throat> is not going to be what they expect their life to be. That is a very big risk. Um, we've all seen patients um, who take their lives. Um, so you have to be very, very careful with a, um, a new schizophrenic patient and with the person adjusting to living with that diagnosis, because some, some, some adolescents, like I say, it's a very high risk um, compared to other situations uh, where people just say, I don't want to live with this. I can see too with hallucinations and delusions and things like that, it might be like a perceived, there's a perceived threat that might not be that's exactly yeah. right. That's yeah. exactly right. There can be all kinds of perceived threats uh, and, and, and misperceived and misunderstanding of the situation that can lead a person to do all kinds of uh, impulsive things, including uh, suicidal behaviors. I think Larkin, you also had a second question. Larkin. 
Yes, I am. This may be more particular given our focus in the conference about injury. Um, how do you distinguish between bipolar, you know, uh, that has a, a genetic load and a frontal um, C, frontal lobe injury, CTE related to injury? Um, people put themselves in those situations and clinically, how do you work that right. out? No. I know it yeah, so that, time. so, th so there'll be, I mean, there are two, two pretty straightforward aspects of that. First of all, you have to always take a careful history and thank you for bringing that up because I talked about trauma, um, as a psychological event and that has to be evaluated when you're evaluating bipolar disorder. But you, act, you actually have to evaluate not only psychological trauma, but physical trauma too, because as you said, brain trauma can present with all kinds of things. Brain trauma is very unpredictable what the, what the, 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 um, what the kind of presentations you will, you will get. So it, it, doing a good history of brain trauma and also um, if available, if possible to do some brain imaging will be, can be very, very helpful. In regular bipolar disorder, there's no reason to do brain imaging. A bipolar disorder doesn't show up on, on, a, on a CAT scan or an MRI, but past injury to the brain will show up on a CAT scan or an MRI and can help differentiate uh, uh, between um, the long-term effects of trauma and an underlying bipolar disorder, yeah, um, so which are very different. Yeah, so how on the symptoms? I mean, how to medically or uh, medicinally treat the symptoms do you treat do you treat mania due to brain injury different than you treat mania due to bipolar well the the rule is that you always want to treat what the underlying condition is so many times if you've had a past history of trauma you may be dealing with a brain bleed you may be dealing with something which where in which you can intervene sometimes there's nothing that you can do that intervene but you may want to, you may be dealing with a, a situation in which you have, like I said, you have a subdural hematoma because of a trauma uh, or something of the nature of that. So you have to do a thorough evaluation um, of, the, of the condition of the brain, of the history of the, history of, of the brain. Um, and then I would say you have to be careful and wait and watch. I would hold that person and, and, and evaluate them for a longer period of time because of, if they're having ma manic-like symptoms, um, but they're actually due to trauma, which would actually be rare. Um, the course is not as clear as it would be with mania. So I would observe them and watch them carefully, not start medications uh, rapidly. Thank you. And spend more time on clarifying the diagnosis before I threw more medications into, the, into that already confused situation. Thank you. Anyway, I'm going to thank everybody because I have a, 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 a another talk to give and I need at least uh, one minute to get over there. But I really appreciate um, your attendance today and you have any further questions, please get in touch. We'll be happy to make resources available to you. And I so appreciate the fact that you care about your patients so much that you're spending time getting yourself educated to do a better job. Um, and um, again, we are very excited about the idea of uh, this collaboration between the U.S. And, and Guyana, and especially the notion that primary care doctors can play a very important role in the, uh, in the mental health of Guyana. You have a very important front row role, front line role to play.